Thanks everybody for coming. We're here today to ask Governor Jay Nixon to commute the sentence of Jeff Mazansky, who's serving a sentence of life without parole for the, for the commission of marijuana crimes. Mr. Mazansky's case is highly unusual. He's the only person in Missouri currently serving a sentence of life without parole for marijuana offenses. And thanks to the criminal code revision passed by this legislature in 2014, no future marijuana-only offenders will, be, uh, will receive life without parole sentences because we as a body collectively realize that this type of sentence is disproportionate for these types of offenses. In a world in which murderers and rapists often serve sentences of 10 years or less, and in which repeat DWI offenders aren't given much more than a slap on the wrist until and sometimes even if they cause someone else's death, it's unfair and unjust that Jeff Mazansky has served over 20 years for using and selling marijuana. That injustice will be compounded if Jeff is allowed to die in prison, which is what will happen if Governor Nixon doesn't act to free him. However, this issue is not just about righting an injustice or about the $400,000 plus that we've spent over the past 20 years incarcerating a nonviolent marijuana offender. It's also about reuniting Jeff Mazansky with his family, including his son Chris, his seven grandchildren, and his one great grandchild. Thanks to the efforts of Chris Mazansky, Jeff's other family members who are in attendance, hundreds of activists throughout Missouri, and others, support for Jeff's clemency has become a popular rallying cry in our state. At the conclusion of this press conference, we will hand deliver two strong signs of that support to the governor's office. The first is these boxes here, nearly 400,000 signatures from a change.org petition started by Chris Mazansky from everyday citizens who signed this because they found it to be an injustice. The second show of support is going to be a letter that's been signed by 127 members of our General Assembly, nearly two-thirds of our legislators. The signees represent a geographically, <coughs> ideologically, and racially diverse group, <coughs> which includes almost two-thirds of the House Republican Caucus. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Mazansky, who will give a few brief remarks. <coughs> Chris has been a tireless fighter for his father. He is himself a devoted father of a son, and uh, I'm really glad to have him here. I'm really glad for all the work he's done on behalf of his father. Thank you, buddy. Um, my dad was a good man. He raised me right. He helped out with a lot of family members and a lot of people in my community. He did get a, himself in a bit of trouble, and he, he's done quite a bit of time for it. I know deep down in my heart that he would do way more better, way better things for people out here on the streets, and, and I'm, I'm quite sure that there's so many more people he would help if he could get out. And, I miss my dad very much. I mean, my whole family does. It, it, there's no words that can explain how much it would mean to have my dad back in my life and out of that pen penitentiary. Um, to be with my family. He's an older man, he ain't got much time left, and I would like for him to be able to spend it with his grandchildren, his children, and his family that really, really miss him. Thank you very much. Next up, we're going to have Representative Paul Fitzwater, who's chairman of the Corrections Committee. I'd like to thank him for his leadership on this issue, for hearing the bill, passing it out of his committee, getting it to the select committee. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Representative Kevin Austin, who's the chair of the select committee on judiciary, which also uh, passed the bill out. Um, the bill is now on the calendar and eligible for a floor vote. Um, as he's done on several other issues, uh, Representative Fitzwater has been very courageous, standing up for what he believes is right in this case. Um, and I'd just like uh, for him to give some remarks. Now. Thank you. Thank you. You know, for the last 21 years, Jeff Mazansky has been a model inmate in the Missouri Correctional Facilities. For those 21 years, Mr. Mazansky has had two minor infractions, and I want to repeat, minor infractions, one for a messy floor and the other for putting a piece of mail in the wrong slot at the mail room. You know, I think that we can all agree that the, those are not serious infractions worthy of further punishment. Mr. Mazansky has paid for the nonviolent crimes he's committed for, with 21 years of his life. You know, I think we have an obligation to ensure that citizens are held accountable for their actions. We also have an obligation to ensure uh, justice is served. And in this case, the punishment does not fit the crime. And a uh, system designed to execute justice has instead been a source of injustice for Mr. Jeff Mazansky. So, uh, 
Mr. Mazansky has served a sentence far greater than the crime committed, and uh, we need to see that justice is given uh, to uh, Mr. Mazansky, and I am asking Governor Nixon for clemency in his case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you all have any questions? Has anyone standing up here had any meetings with Governor Nixon personally or with his staff about this particular issue? Yes, last week. I'm, I'm sorry, could you identify Yes, we met with Governor Nixon's legal counsel last week. And could you identify yourself? I'm Dan Beats. I'm one of the attorneys representing Jeff. And how did that, can you characterize how that meeting went? Did, did you get I think meeting? it was a good meeting that the, we were assured that the governor is seriously considering uh, granting some form of clemency. Give you any, any indication why it's taken him so long to consider this? Well, no. You know, we are concerned about his health, and that's one point that we tried to make to uh, to the governor's attorney: is that Jeff's health is, is is not good. Prison is a very unhealthy place to be, but Jeff specifically has a large tumor growing on on one of his forearms, and I mean a large tumor. And anyone who's outside getting normal health care would have had that removed by now. Prison doctors have told him it's nothing to worry about, but no one, no one who sees that would not worry about it. In addition to that, his, his leg was seriously injured in a work-related accident. Several years ago, the leg was not set, it was neglected. He now is crippled because of his time in prison. You know, prison is cruel. Uh, it's not unusual, but it is cruel punishment. And it is urgent that he be released as soon as possible. I was going to say, I'm Amber Langston with Show Me Cannabis, and uh, a year ago... Mike, if you're going to talk to Sure, thanks. I'm Amber Langston, uh, Deputy Director of Show Me Cannabis, and I did want to say it is worth mentioning that we uh, did a similar action to this about a year ago uh, with these change.org petitions, and we delivered about 350,000. Uh, it's only grown since then, obviously, uh, but we did meet with the governor's office about a year ago at this time, and uh, so they've, they've had it on their radar for quite a while, and we're hopeful that... Uh, they won't take any more time making a decision on this. Thanks. How do you respond to critics who would say he knew what the, he knew what the penalties were when he did the crimes, he should certain time that he was risking when he did the crimes? How do you respond to those, that, that kind of criticism? He didn't know. Would you Very few set up the mic, please? Sure. Very few people realize how incredibly harsh the Missouri marijuana laws are. And although that statute under which he was sentenced has been repealed effective January of 2017, it's still on the books right now. It allows people convicted of, of two prior drug-related felonies, which could be possessing an ounce and a half or even passing a joint I've seen charged as a felony. Um, if, you're if you have two such convictions, your third one, you're facing 10 to life without parole, without possibility of probation or parole, an extremely harsh law. Jeff had no idea that that law existed. Uh, he had no idea that anyone would be facing that type of punishment. He was clearly punished because he went to trial on his third offense and was found guilty. Punishment would have been far less harsh if he pled guilty, but our system punishes people for going to trial. Are there any other prisoners in the system um, right now that you feel deserves um, this sort of attention? Well, there are a lot of people serving time for marijuana who don't need to be there, but Jeff's case is probably the worst. I want to say there's a lot of some legislature that aren't for legalization of marijuana. But some of these punishments and penalties, uh, when I was in the Senate, I represented three correction centers. A, a huge part of the, of the uh, population were, were drug offense related. Some of them were very minor. And in out state right now, we're, we're giving penalties that in some other parts of the states wouldn't even get parole. I mean, probation, it, it's just... Uh, we have to take a look at it. The legislature has taken a look at it the last few years, and we're saying that we need to examine this. Do taxpayers really need to be keep putting out seventeen to twenty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate people that uh, smoked pot twenty years ago? I mean, we have a former president. I've never smoked pot. I got a former president. I, I would have been smart enough to know to inhale, and he wasn't. But are we going to say that those are the people that, in the same time period, that? The person we're talking about today uh, got convicted that they were admitted they were smoking pot and our current president was trying cocaine and we're going to put these people in jail for life or, or we had one in my area where, where multiple years I think it was 25 years they got for for growing I think it was 10 plants now there were some other circumstances but we have to look if that situation was in another part of the state 
they wouldn't have got any time. And does the taxpayers really want to pay for these types of criminals being in that long, that period of time? It's one thing to do some correction. It's another thing to put them away forever. And that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of us that aren't for legalization, but support the re-examination of these things. Really? How would you characterize that re-examination effort? Is that a serious movement within the legislature? I don't know if it's serious yet, but at some point we'll talk about it. It's just what they were talking about, the, the city of came out yesterday of St. Louis of how many of the, grind, of the the gun crimes that are getting no penalty. That if the same crime would have taken place in St. Francis County, you'd have been booked 10 to 20 years. And so we have to take a look and say, is this, and, and there's an effect there. And so I think the legislature is willing to look at the fact they're not, they're, I don't think they're prepared to say we're gonna legalize marijuana, I, I know that. But I think they're, they're, they're starting to have more and more examination of what we're paying for in our prisons and uh, as we take money away from our education system and other areas mental health and we're really going to keep somebody in high level prison for the rest of their lives for, for uh, marijuana marijuana violations that's that's what i think that, that the legislature is starting to examine a little bit and say is this is that right really You don't hear legislators say this very often, but I really don't want my bill to pass. <laughs> it would be wonderful if the governor would just take this bill out of consideration and grant clemency tomorrow. The sooner the better. So if we don't have to go down the legislative road, that's the ideal outcome for my bill. All right, well thank you thank all for coming. We're thank gonna you. go and present these now. I'll walk over to the governor's office. You're free to join us.